text of Mataji, giving talks, interviews, providing social commentary, and performing rituals at her temple and elsewhere, such as the Kumbh Melas. Now, analysis of the teachings and practices of the other guru, Sadvi Hemanangiri, whom I shall refer to hereafter as Swamini, draws upon the information obtained through um, social media platforms where her devotees uploaded videos of her interviews, teachings, and song and ritual performances. In more than 15 videos, Swamini shares her knowledge with people in India, Nepal, Mauritius, and Hungary. As Swamini's status as a female Shankaracharya was announced in late 2018 from Nepal, I utilized her archived online videos, primarily YouTube, as primary data. Importantly, the guru's self-declarations as Shankaracharyas profoundly break the conventional patriarchal mold for the type of guru women can be and the kind of authorized religious power they can have in this male-dominated role. Thus, I argue that the gurus invoke charismatic authority by emphasizing the immediacy of the personal realization of the divine and the potency of religious emotions as sources of revelation. By performing these revelations, they construct an alternative ways of practicing Hinduism, defined around modernist ideals such as gender equality, inclusion, and women's and human rights. Moreover, they promote the normalization of women's institutional leadership at the pinnacle of the monastic hierarchy. For context, Mataji, whom you see on, on the left, the viewer's left, um, lives in Prayagraj, Uttar Pradesh. Born in 1965 in Mirzapur, she comes from a lower middle class family of peanut farmers in a subordinated caste. She is one of four siblings and the third child of her parents. Intelligent, keenly self-aware, and impatient with small talk. Mataji has a commanding presence and is purposeful in her interactions. From our first meeting in 2014, I learned that she expects people to say what they mean and mean what they say. Her daily routine consists of waking at 4 a.m., worshiping the temple deities, meditating, doing postural yoga for an hour, then reading the daily newspaper while having her breakfast of seasonal fruit and milk. She spends the rest of the day with her devotees at the ashram or at their homes, fundraising to build other centers in India and organizing in-house and outreach public events in which she connects women's rights to Hindu teachings. Mataji is confident, but not arrogant, by which I mean she uses the knowledge that she has acquired through experience to correct others. As she has faced personal hardship for self-protection, Mataji has built a tough exterior. She stands up for her rights and rarely suffers fools. In 2000, at the age of 35 years, Mataji left her life as a housewife for good and became a sadhu. Her husband and son objected, but she ignored them and pursued a religious path. She took initiation, Diksha, in Prayagraj from a male guru of the Saraswati order of the Dashanami sect. Her Diksha occurred at midnight on the banks of the Ganges River. After relocating to an ashram near the Triveni Sangam in Prayagraj, where the Ganges, Yamuna, and subterranean Saraswati rivers form a confluence, Mataji separated from her spouse and sent her children to live with her relatives. However, she provided for them financially until they started college. Mataji maintains contact with her daughter, but not with her son or former spouse. As a sadhu, 
Mataji applied her leadership training from an NGO in Benares, where she worked to the religious field, immersing herself in grassroots activism with poor urban women and children and women survivors of domestic abuse. In 2004, she founded an NGO named the Sri Gayatri Mata Gyan Mahayagya Samiti. In 2014, she founded a female ascetic order named Pariyakara, which I have translated as Society of the Freebirds. Currently, Mataji heads a monastic center or mutt in Prayagraj, where two different families and two elderly brahmacharinis have settled. Mataji, in 2008, Mataji announced her self-appointment as a leader, as a female Shankaracharya, via the local and regional Hindi language news and print media. Prior to this, she had sought ordination as a Maha Mandaleshwar through another Akara led by a high-ranking guru. However, she declined to complete the ritual because she could not accept the terms of the order. She felt that its practices would subvert her leadership power and thwart her stated mission to create an authentic Akara culture that provides equal opportunities to female monastics to develop their talents. The news of her self-appointment came a month after the Kumbh Mela in Prayagraj in 2007. Mataji said she had a mystical vision in which the deities Durga and Shiva appeared to her as though flashes of lightning, and they told her that she would be the female Shankaracharya of India. It occurred during the annual Magh Mela, January through February, uh, February festival in Prayagraj, while she was putting up the signboard to her camp. Mataji interpreted her vision to mean that it was an ordination performed by the gods, which thus invested her with the status of Shankaracharya and installed her in the office. Her visionary experience provides an alternative form of diksha for Mataji's authority. Although the gods that Mataji recognizes in her visions represent pan-Indian deities, she perceives her power to have been bestowed upon her by deities linked to a specific region of India, in her case, the Triveni Sangam. Mataji associates her power with the regional form of Shiva called Sarveshwar Mahadev and with the localized river goddesses Ganga, Yamuna, and Saraswati, which personify the Sangam. This explains why Mataji has established herself in Prayagraj and why she has named her center in order the Sarveshwar Mahadev Triveni Prayagapit. The word pit or pita translates as place of power. She has declared her seat of power to be in Prayagraj to show that her alternative authority as a female Shankaracharya in India is tied to Prayagraj and it has been bestowed upon her by the gods of Prayagraj. They have authorized Mataji to become a female leader in a precise location, which has enabled her to organize an ascetic order which parallels the male tradition. Our second claimant, Swamini, lives in Gauri Ganj, Nepal. Born in 1975 in Birgunj, Swamini comes from a professional family in a dominant caste. She is the only child of her parents. Her father worked as a labor commissioner in the local magistrate's court, and her mother taught in a public school. Based on the online material that I have studied, Swamini has graceful mannerisms and exudes a sense of calm and clarity while maintaining a laser-sharp focus on the conversation in which she participates. She is knowledgeable about the Hindu tradition, citing various texts and passages. Judging from the digital collection of interviews given by her, 
Swamini is well regarded in Nepal, India, and Hungary. She listens to her interlocutors and responds thoughtfully to their questions. She extends kindness to the people whom she meets, is attentive to others, and has a gentle demeanor. Her social interactions affirm a sense of common humanity, and they emphasize the importance of selfless service, Seva. She wears flowing robes dyed in bright orange, which she wraps around herself and paints a large round dot bindu on her forehead to signify her spiritual power. During the process of observing her interviews, I found Swamini's music video professionally produced in which she constructs the Shankaracharya identity around the roles of healer, activist, teacher, and peacemaker. She calls herself a priest of world peace. Using similar methods to Mataji, Swamini made her leadership role publicly known in 2018 via the regional news and print media. This occurred after she lost her bid for the Shankaracharya candidacy that same year and before the Kumbh Mela of 2019 took place in Prayagraj. Swamini was one of four candidates and the only woman nominated to become part of the mainstream tradition. If chosen, she would become the next Shankaracharya and the first female leader of the Jyotir Monastery in Badrinath, India. The center was involved in a prolonged legal dispute between two Shankaracharyas, namely the late Swami Swarupa Nanda Saraswati, who passed away on September 11, 2022, and Swami Vasudeva Nanda Saraswati. Following the Allahabad High Court's decision in 2017, which ordered the established leaders to select a new Shankaracharya for the Jyotir Monastery, Swamini was nominated for the role. Despite the backing of some high profile male gurus who take part in the conventional system, including Swami Vasudevananda Saraswati, and despite receiving an endorsement from a Pusant Akhara with significant qualifications, the all-male organizations known as the Vidvat Kashi Parishad and the Bharat Dharmaha Mandal, which consist of Brahmin Sanskrit scholars, rejected her nomination. Swami Swarupa Nanda Saraswati once again assumed control of the leadership role. In the year that she announced her candidacy, Swamini identified Swami Vasudeva Nanda Saraswati as her Diksha Guru, who initiated her into sannyas. However, following her self-appointment into a leadership role, the terms of their relationship have become ambiguous. She has not mentioned the guru's name since she has been in her new role. Despite this, significantly, Swamini has established herself in Nepal. Now, I note here that the Shankaracharya monastic tradition is specific to India. So she announced her, her new leadership role from Nepal, and she leads from an unaffiliated center, which means the leaders do not recognize her center as being part of their monastic system. Swamini validates her authority by calling on the blessings of Pashupatinath, which is a form of Shiva popular in Nepal that is associated with Hindu ascetic culture and symbolizes the practice of sannyas. Now, she, she suggests that the God has ordained her to lead from Nepal, although she doesn't claim to have diksha through visions. Swamini has named the center she leads as the Pashupatinath Peet, which is not to be confused with the Pashupatinath Temple, thus aligning her power with this God. Her leadership role is conducted outside of mainstream religious practice. As with Mataji, her role is rendered legitimate through the power of a God that is connected to a place. In addition to male deities, both gurus view themselves as empowered by the goddess Durga, who has given them the status of a female Shankaracharya. 
A martial goddess, Durga is widely popular in South Asian Hinduism. Based on her mythology, which is featured in Hindu literary texts such as the Devi Mahatmya and the Devi Bhagavata Purana, but also retold in countless oral traditions, Durga destroys the demons that threaten the cosmic order. She protects the world from evil and restores balance. Hindu goddess traditions such as Shaktism and Tantric Shaktism imagine Durga as the great goddess or Devi. She is the supreme female, the universal power of life, and the divine mother. She creates and sustains the world, which is associated with her, but she also transcends it. She is both part of and beyond material reality. In the practice of their religion, Mataji and Swamini invoke Durga's martial symbolism to justify their authority outside the monastic mainstream. Drawing upon the trope of the Shankaracharya as the leader of the Hindu religion, which is a representation with roots in the martial history of Hindu monastic orders in colonial India, the gurus construct themselves as leaders of female armies which strive for equality. By comparing themselves with Durga, the gurus claim to have received the power of the goddess that enables them to trounce the forces of patriarchy and misogyny and to realign the balance of power by installing women as monastic leaders. They do not see their leadership as violating the principles of the Hindu religion, but as restoring the exalted status of women revealed to them by the goddess Durga. To be clear, although the gurus hold the same title, they lead separate women's orders from different monastic centers. And each woman claims to be the first female Shankaracharya of the Hindu tradition. As Shankaracharyas, Mataji and Swamini occupy the highest position of authority within a Shaiva-centered Hindu monastic tradition that dates back 1,200 years, beginning with the first lineage guru, Adi Shankaracharya. In this respect, female gurus who claim the status for themselves appropriate a traditionally male category of monastic authority, hitherto available only to qualifying by caste Brahmin men. This is because the system is structured as a hereditary priesthood. The founder, Adi Shankaracharya, led his followers using the power of his personality, that is charisma. Whereas Shankaracharyas today lead by using the power of their office. Male Shankaracharyas are appointed by others. They are not called to the role as the women are, and they do not appoint themselves. By limiting who can inherit the role, mainstream traditions have thus construed high caste male authority as institutionally normative. In this regard, the radical authority which Mataji and Swamini assume and the weight and importance of the status that they have claimed, okay, become clear. As Shankaracharyas, the gurus formalize women's legitimacy, which means the right to influence others, as they are at the top of a structure with a titled position. And thus they have the ability to raise the status of women and render women's authority institutionally normative. As they are bypassing the restrictions of the mainstream tradition, the gurus implement a new institutional normativity that reveals how they are using their newfound status as promulgators of feminist-leaning ideas for Hindu morality and feminine virtue. In religion, proximity to the divine has been a catalyst for new revelations and ways of attaining truth. Mataji's and Swamini's leadership asserts an alternative narrative for women's monastic authority, wherein 
it is institutionally normative. Now, regarding mainstream practices, their female authority proffers a gendered alternative. Indeed, their leadership is based specifically on charisma. Catherine Wessinger's sociological model defines charisma as the qualities of holiness and enlightened consciousness, which are either claimed by leaders or those qualities are ascribed to them by their followers. As charismatic gurus, Mataji and Swamini lead by the power of their personalities. By appointing themselves as leaders, the gurus endeavor to confront the problem of high caste male privilege within the established system, dismantle dominant hierarchies that disenfranchise minorities, and alter prevailing attitudes and customs that condition women and oppressed identities to be subordinate. Their leadership as female Shankaracharyas distinguishes them from other gurus, thus ensuring that their feminine gender comprises a new element of this religious tradition. Women's presence in authoritative roles is vital to troubling the dominant narrative of religious patriarchy that at the time of my research continues to deny women authority. At the same time, it is integral to altering access points within the religious hierarchy of monastic institutions that have long been resistant to change. Let us now return to the question posed earlier in the presentation. How does charisma in the context, as I said, of personal revelatory experience, how does charisma influence the gurus to resist and even defy worldviews invested with absolute status? This question becomes more pronounced considering the nature of charisma. As Weber argued in the sociology of religion, charisma may be the source of religious insight, inspiration, and powerful gifts of the spirit. However, it is also unstable. Charisma must be constituted through the personality, experiences, actions, and missions of the leaders so that their followers continue to believe in them. This aspect of charisma poses a problem for charismatic leaders and especially female gurus occupying positions of power and authority. This is because they are historically associated with men and they inhabit religious cultures which socialize women to be humble and obedient. Data collected through ethnographic observations and from the gurus' social media platforms, particularly their teachings captured on video, suggest that the answer to our question lies in the psychophysiological states that the gurus associate with their charismatic experiences. On the one hand, they emphasize charisma and revelation as the central source of their specialized knowledge. On the other hand, they also speak about how they feel in their hearts and bodies during an experience. They describe charisma traveling down to the bone, touching the deep structures of the mind and the body. It generates an experience that is as affective as it is transformative. Along with their visions, dreams, auditory revelations, and so on, they experience intense feelings, emotions, memories, sensations, and perceptions that profoundly reorient their moral sensibilities and their relationship to the worlds they live in. In other words, charisma occurs simultaneously with affectivity. Both components engender enlightened consciousness and they impress and solidify dispositions within the mind-body complex. It is in part through affect that the gurus have learned what being Hindu and feminist mean at the bodily level. By approaching 
the study of gurus and charismatic authority through the lens of affectivity. My work follows Robert Orsi's study that in that something called religion, this is his uh, quote from his work, something called religion cannot be neatly separated from the other practices of everyday life, from the way that human beings work on the landscape, for instance, or dispose of corpses or arrange for the security of their offspring. Nor can religion be separated from the material circumstances in which specific instances of religious imagination and behavior arise and to which they respond." End quote. As the gurus accentuate the attainment of self-realization to enhance religious authority, this presentation explores their descriptions of revelatory experience in great detail and it examines its implications for women's leadership roles. My work builds on the arguments of the historian of religion, Karen Pachillis, with regard to ideas of revelation as self-realization and the female guru as being universal. I contend that the gurus as self-styled Shankaracharyas construct their alternative authority by emphasizing two interrelated themes. These concern the immediacy of the personal realization of the Atma or the self, the indestructible self, the universal consciousness, Brahman, or the truth, Brahmagyan. And they emphasize the potency of affect as sources of revelation upon which basis they align Hindu teachings with their assertion of normative rights. Their emphasis on being divine messengers places the guru's alternative authority in a Hindu moral framework to motivate society and mobilize change. Let us now turn our attention to their teachings to acquire a better sense of the role of charismatic influence on women's monastic lives. One of the ways in which the gurus establish their charismatic authority concerns their narrative representations of themselves as self-realized God women. In 2019, I returned to Prayagraj to work with Mataji during the Kumbh Mela. One evening, while we waited for a journalist from Mumbai to arrive at her temple for an interview, I asked Mataji to talk about her leadership role. I wanted to know the categories she uses to interpret herself. Does she view herself as an activist, healer, reformer, feminist? Mataji um, responded by describing herself as absorbed in Brahman consciousness, immersed in the emotion or bhav of Shiva, or whom she referred to as Parampita Parameshwar, integrated with the cosmos and nature and connected to all the gods and the Atma. These are her words. I cannot explain what I think of myself. There are no words, no pictures that can explain what I am. Everything that is present in the universe, I see myself like that. So God, Parameshwar, has given me the opportunity to attain God knowledge. Brahmagyan. And through that knowledge, I have become God. Everything is in me. Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh, all are in me. And I am in everything. Like the whole universe came out of God, I think of myself like that. I am a single one, but you can put any number of zeros after one. We're all from one world, and I want to make one world where there is no differentiation. I talk of equality, the word she uses is Samantha, as we are all born from God and we all have God in ourselves. We are all equal. Changing the religion is a big work and it will take time. I am like a small bulb that lights up the whole room. I am the sun behind the clouds and when they disappear, I will shine. Similarly, 
Swamini talks about realizing God consciousness to assert her charismatic authority in the wider male-dominated monastic culture that does not recognize it. In the interviews that she gives, she emphasizes that she has mixed, those are her terms, her consciousness with that of the universal absolute, united, again, her terms, her mind and body with the supreme being, Pashupatinath, and integrated, her terms, herself with the world. In 2018, Swamini told a Nepali TV journalist the following. Life is all about peace and happiness. Life is an opportunity. God has sent the world a messenger in Nepal for the betterment of life. I am working for the revival of self-power among the people of Nepal. Spiritual power provides us with self-power, improves confidence, and makes us, makes us peaceful and better people. I am the Brahman. I am the consciousness of the universe, and I am the one who is leading the world by integrating with it. Hindu religion believes in inclusiveness. The word she uses is samavesh. I am starting a movement for inclusiveness of everyone. We have to make everyone equal by seeing and treating them as equal. We created so many castes in our religion because of wrong knowledge. I have realized the truth that God created humans as equal. God came in the human form to this earth. So for me, everyone is equal. Everyone is a messenger of God. Everyone in my ashram recites the Gayatri Mantra, which is a Vedic prayer. Women and men from oppressed castes, this is Swamini speaking still, women and men from oppressed castes recite it with me. We perform Vedic rituals together. I have opened the door for everyone to participate in the practices of the Hindu religion. Discrimination based on caste and sex is totally wrong. We must make our thoughts and behaviors pure by seeing and treating everyone as equal. Both gurus represent their God consciousness, their realization of God consciousness as being akin to an integrative state. Charismatic experience creates the feeling of becoming mixed with and absorbed into the inner self, Atma, the supreme self, Brahman, and the universe, the Brahmand. Attaining self-realization is not only synonymous with receiving knowledge from the Atma and the Brahman, as it also induces the bodily experience of God presence. Each guru says that she sees, hears, feels, smells, touches, and tastes the truth revealed by the Brahman. In particular, Mataji's narratives relate God consciousness to a religious mood or a Mahabhav. She suggests that God is sensed as and through religious emotion and experiencing God produces the intensification of feeling in two respects. The emotions are stronger and her sensitivity to emotions is improved. Self-realization is therefore not disembodied, absent of pathos, or dissociative, meaning a break from reality to these gurus, but rather it embodies God as they feel intertwined with everything in existence. Another way for the gurus to construct their charismatic authority involves linking God consciousness with the potency of affect to emphasize the efficacy of revelation. What happens to the guru's bodies during revelatory experience alters their perceptions of themselves, the world, and their relationship to it. They say that the revelation occurs through the atma and is situational, meaning that the revelation speaks directly to the circumstances of the context of the initial delivery. Affect, then, is conjoined with revelation and it impacts how the gurus learn and embody what being Hindu means. Both gurus talk a great deal 
about the sensations they experience through revelation. During our meetings, Mataji said that she heard the voice of the Atma speaking to her through the heart mind. As she explained, the heart mind represents the center of spiritual energy in the chest area that receives messages from the Atma and sends them to the mind-body system. The voice heard from within told Mataji that, quote, God created men and women as equals, end quote. When the Atma speaks to her, other sensations come into her consciousness and provide a coordinate source of information for interpreting the revelation. When physically sensing the Atma, her body responds by producing different sensations, such as the feeling of heat in the chest, um, which she perceives as the heart melting with love, all over tingling or paresthesia, and buoyancy, feeling as light as a feather. These reactions are temporary, lasting only a few minutes, though they are significant. Mataji perceives them as not only being soul signals, but as bodily confirmation that the experience is real. This is why I had mentioned earlier the efficacy of the revelation based on these kinds of sensations or affectivity. The efficacy of charismatic experience is borne out in the body so that it authenticates the revelation. Mataji says that her revelations fill her whole being with a sense of inner peace, happiness, and security. Affect arouses awareness of her intrinsic goodness and dignity, of belonging to God and the world, and of the female sadhu as normative to the male sadhu. This is considered to be a normative experience. This experience becomes the basis for Mataji's construction of equality as the female birthright. And it justifies the idea that it is a fundamentally Hindu concept. So Mataji's narrative representations suggest that the revelation is transmitted through affect. Sensory experience grounds the revelation in her body as physical proof of the immediacy of charisma while generating inner spiritual potency as darshan. That is, she has a visionary experience of God and attains divine universal consciousness. Aside from sensory experience, the emotions associated with integrative states confirm that the guru's attainment of Hindu truth is congruent with rights-based values. Mataji emphasizes love through the performance of revelation. She describes love as a feeling in which her mind, body consciousness expands beyond the limits of ordinary subjectivity and mixes with the universe. Love realized as God consciousness is simultaneously a sensational, emotional, bodily, and spiritual experience. For her, it brings a sense of permeability. Every part of her being, from her toes to her and fingers to her legs and arms to her eyelashes and the hair on her head, absorbs the elements of the world around her. It is a feeling of expansion and fusion, of joining with God and the entirety of the cosmos. Her experience of the intrinsic permeability of the material self, meaning the individual, rouses sensations of becoming um, uh, fluid, as fluid, akin to water, and of becoming infinite, akin to the cosmos. In effect, it strengthens her belief that we are all equal. For Mataji, feeling love heightens her awareness that she is essentially everything, and vice versa. It stimulates her personal consciousness of the permeability of the material world, and it reveals the knowledge that everything in existence is fundamentally interconnected. Emotions, such as love, have spiritual potency because through them, 
Mataji experiences the revelation that she is the world she inhabits and that she consists of the same material and spiritual components that comprise interdependent life. Furthermore, the immediacy of the permeability of material existence enables her to refute religious practices um, or refute religious patriarchal ideals and patriarchal practices of male superiority and female inferiority. It shows her that as all life is permeable and divisible, men and women share the same normative status. As they are composed of the same elements, they share a common humanity and are inherently equal. Swamini emphasizes a related conception of integrative awareness based on her experiential understanding of the material self as permeable and of life as interconnected. She links enlightened consciousness with the attitude of positivity. Her idea of positivity is consonant with Mataji's principle of love. In Swamini's theology, positivity comprises a cluster of religious emotions, such as love, happiness, peace, and care for others. It compels her to reach out and lift others up, encouraging people by instilling in them a sense of confidence, capability, bravery, and purpose. In her experience of positivity, Swamini indicated feeling as though her material self becomes less solid, meaning she perceives herself as having disintegrated into the elements of air, fire, water, earth, and ether. That is that she integrated with others and then she was absorbed into herself. I'll read that sentence again. Swamini indicated feeling as though her material self became less solid, that she integrated with others, and then she was reabsorbed into herself. The experience activated her realization that people share parts of their being while simultaneously incorporating others into themselves. To Swamini, this is what it means to be alive, to be present for the reality of life which is interconnected. Swami credits nature with revealing this insight to her. She envisions nature as the goddess Prakriti, who in Hindu theology, such as Sankhya and Yoga, represents the divine principle of materiality, meaning that material existence comprises five elements and being permeable, they're always in flux. Nature comprises both the material world and a divine female in Swamini's theology. In accordance with her reasoning, if the goddess exists as the world that she permeates with her power, then she can show herself in the materiality of life, including feelings, emotions, and sensations. Now, I would argue that Swamini encounters goddess presence via the potency of affect. The goddess as nature appears and reveals information to Swamini through a confluence of emotions and sensations. In this sense, she learns that everyone is essentially connected and that they share in each other's humanity. One's humanity is measured by experiencing others' humanity, which comprises their own. I interpret Swamini's statements to mean that, quote, we are all one and, quote, we are all the same in this way. She equates equality and inclusiveness with the status of religious truths, thereby constructing them as spiritually potent and based on the immediacy of bodily experiences. Spiritual efficacy of these ideals manifests in the body as Swamini said.
When I was 13 years old, Nepali Baba Jagatacharya started his Nepal Yatra, and my mother and me were part of that trip. We traveled to 75 districts and visited more than 10,000 temples. I got the opportunity to taste water and food from all 75 of these districts. In the past, in the Hindu religion, everyone used to drink from the same well. There was no caste, jati, or class, varna divisions. We have lost our culture and the distinction of being a world teacher, Vishvaguru, because of the discrimination that we have created between ourselves. What we see today is people fighting with each other over petty issues. We are seeing an increase in corruption, pollution, all sorts of problems and negative thoughts. This is depleting our power, energy, and bravery. The problem that we are facing today in Nepal is mostly because of the lack of respect for women. We are not giving them proper opportunities. We should respect women and woman power if we want to be a great country. But we have lost self-power. We have forgotten the principles of dharam. Swamini, through her narrative telling, performs acts relating to the materiality of enlightenment by calling attention to her personal realization that the universe is permeable and in interconnected. She indicates that the spiritual potency of everyday material acts, such as religious journeying on foot and eating and drinking water with people whom she meets, are sources of revelation. However, quotidian practices not only reveal penetrating insight into the natural world, significantly they motivate Swamini's religious feminist engagement with it. Struck by an acute fever of emotions, she feels moved to embrace others, affirm dignity, respect their natural birthright, and heal the festering wounds of discrimination, exploitation, and depression caused by ascribed social differences. Swamini and Mataji suggest that the immediacy of self-realization impacts the deep structures of the mind and the body. Mataji emphasizes the statement, quote, absorbing the truth, end quote. It details a prominent material metaphor for her personal realization of God in her narratives. In this respect, the materiality of God consciousness is suggested by her comment, quote, I have absorbed the truth, end quote. This separates Mataji from the mainstream Shankaracharyas who, as she says, quote, only cram the Vedas in their heads without embodying it in their character, end quote. This emphasis constructs her status as the real Chankaracharya. However, a further implication concerns the fact that the revelation impacts Mataji at the cellular level. Every molecule of her body is touched by the self-realization of the Brahman, such that she feels that she, quote, eats God, tastes God, smells God, and sees God. In 2018, Mata Mataji told me, spirituality which is called religion. It means that you superimpose the truth on yourself. It means to speak the truth, to eat the truth, to wear the truth, to live in an environment of truth, to walk on the path of truth, and to guide others about the truth, to give one the right direction. I felt it. I am the original Shankaracharya. Only the person who has absorbed the truth can be called a Shankaracharya. End of her narrative. Both gurus underscore that personal transformation is a direct function of affect. For Swamini, affect emerges through the emotion of positivity, 
and for Mataji, she feels love. And the, these emotions are activated through revelation. It transforms them spiritually, emotionally, and physically, shifting their perceptions from ignorance to wisdom and restoring their bodies from sickness to health. By performing charisma, that's what I'm arguing, performing charisma, performing revelation through these kinds of narrative tellings. By performing charisma, the gurus engender a correlation between the spiritual and the material. To conclude, this presentation has shown the impact of personal charisma on modern women's monastic lives through an analysis of the revelatory experiences of two self-styled female Shankaracharyas. Motivated by their revelation and the universal problem of suffering, these gurus have organized grassroots women's liberation movements comprising people across social identities to uproot patriarchal mentalities regarding female sadhus' inferiority and to change the monastic culture. We have seen the tangible effects of charismatic authority in terms of how they have established separate monastic lineages for women in India, such as Mataji and Nepal for Swamini. They have established these lineages in order to give female sadhus, many of whom come from disadvantaged backgrounds, a female identified place away from the male gaze where they can be nurtured, learn skills, imbibe ideas beneficial to their well being, and develop their full potential because they are women. Their establishment of female led traditions not only asserts the primacy of women, but it also constructs women's monastic authority as institutionally normative. These forward-facing gurus combine modernist ideals with Hindu religious worldviews in order to enhance women's fundamental rights in relation to equality of opportunity and freedom from sex and caste discrimination. At the same time, they raise awareness of the struggles of female sadhus within the male dominated hierarchy of Hindu monastic orders. Although their orders are separate from the male led system, female led traditions may impact traditional conceptions of holiness and power, thus potentially opening doors for women in the future. Whether in person or via social media, these Shankaracharyas are mobilizing a new institutional normativity that shatters the glass ceiling of authorized religious power and which elevates women's status, thus affecting seismic cultural shifts. Their lives, teachings, and activism provide an alternate world for women and girls who decide to fly from the cage toward from the cage of patriarchal traditions toward a promising horizon of female achievement, which can be obtained through the leadership of two indefatigable gurus who are devoted to achieving that outcome. While their inversion of power dynamics is not equivalent to transforming patriarchal monastic society, as the latter would require abolishing hierarchies rather than reversing the status of dominant and oppressed groups, the move is consequential nonetheless, bringing women closer to achieving complete humanity and securing hopeful futures. Thank you very much. That was a great, wonderful talk. Super insightful. And I've invited uh, our attendees to ask any questions. They can unmute themselves and ask directly. They can also type in chat window if they prefer. But uh, I think we learned a lot. I had no clue myself that there are already female. We were at the verge of getting first female Shankaracharya in the history of this Tashnami 
Sampradaya, the Swami Parampara that Adi Shankaracharya established. I had no clue. When did that happen? Very recently, right? When this claim to female Shankaracharya so, was. So for um, Mataji, her claim began in 2008. And it okay. happened following the 2007 Kumbh Mela that was held in Prayagraj. So she, okay. her first claim, her first claim that she is the self, the, the new female Shankaracharya, the first female Shankaracharya of the Hindu tradition. Mm -hmm. That happened, that happened in 2008. With Swamini, it happened 10 years later. Okay. And her, and her um, explicit um, um, representation of herself as, again, she says, the first female Shankaracharya of the Hindu tradition happened after she lost the nomination to become mm. the first female Shankaracharya of the Jyotir Monastery. Mm. So she was nominated by some very high ranking gurus, um, by um, she had the support of Vasudevananda Saraswati, who is um, claiming to be the Shankaracharya of the Jyotir Monastery, but he was fighting for, you know, since 1982, Swami, uh, Swami Vasudevananda Saraswati and Swami, uh, the former, the late Swami Swarupananda mm -hmm. Saraswati, they have been involved in a very prolonged legal battle for who is the real Shankaracharya. Very unfortunate. These legal... That's right, the, the Jyotir Monastery. Yeah. But nonetheless, when I met, I met, um, Swami Vasudevananda in the summer of 2018, and he was there with his lawyers and his his <laughs> his team, his oh, team. Gosh. And he said, "Look, these are my papers." He showed me <laughs> his his papers of the guru saying that he would be the successor. So, but nonetheless, um, the Allahabad High Court ruled that no, there's got to be uh, a woman or somebody mm. else ruling. You can't have, because Swarupananda was still the Shankaracharya of Dwarka, you know, of, of you know, the oh, Shardama. Yeah. So yes. how can he rule two of them? So the mm -hmm. Allahabad High Court says, you got to find somebody else for the Jyotir Monastery. So being Vasudevananda's Chela disciple, um, Swamini was nominated for the role, but well, even then she lost it. They lost, they lost. We have a question from Dr. Garima Yadav. Uh, you can unmute yourself and you can ask directly, please. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nepali, for this informative presentation. Uh, I'm curious, maybe I missed, uh, but I want to know whether the caste identity of the female guru uh, play an important role in the charisma that is that is really important in this whole discourse. Because uh, now I'm building upon that question that the followers also, uh, you know, play an important role in creation of the category of guru and the guruship that is created. So at times the caste identity, which is at renounced to become a guru, um, but still play it plays an important role for the followers uh, to, you know, to get attracted and uh, to be a part of uh, the guru movement or, or to join um, that monastery or something like that. So if you can please uh, share some light on that. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for that question. It's a great question. And so um, Mataji comes from a subordinated caste. And I would say that has been um, the flame, no pun intended, the flame that has really ignited this, mm -hmm. this self-realization of how the, the you know, entrenched in inequities within Hindu monastic mm -hmm. structures. And it's also been the reason why the, uh, the established leaders within the conventional system have refused to sanction um, mm -hmm. this idea. And it, sometimes it feels like they're open to the idea of a female Shankaracharya, but not this one because she comes from mm -hmm. a subordinated caste because the Shankaracharya mm -hmm. lineage, that, that is really in many ways paralleling the hereditary priesthood that is mm -hmm. a characteristic of um, Brahminical Hinduism. Now, here's where it becomes um, a bit confusing because Swamini comes from a dominant caste. So she is a Brahmin. She comes from a Brahmin family. Um, and so when some leaders from the established tradition are looking to delegitimize um, her claims, they will bring up the idea that she was married. So they don't mention oh. caste, but they will mention that she was previously married, as was Mataji. But the, you know, 
the phenomenon of a Shankaracharya, really, ideally, the Shankaracharya within the male uh, lineage um, is a Bal Brahmachari. You know, from childhood, they, they've been celibate. However, mm -hmm. in the history of the Shankaracharya tradition, particularly with the Puri, the Puri Mat, um, and the Puri Pitam. Yes, there has been a Shankaracharya who was married, who became okay. established on the throne, and then he became, um, you know, the it, it, sannyas. So, um, but when it comes to, because when you think of how these these gurus, these female gurus, are influencing um, their their followers, their leaders, and really just as diverse an audience as they can, because. Um, a lot of what they're doing is being uh, put on social media that mm -hmm. their followers for for Mataji, there I've met Brahmins, I've met Rajputs, I have met Bunyas, I have met Dalits, I have met, you know, people across the caste tradition. And what is more, in Mataji's case, some of her most devout followers are not Hindu. They're mm -hmm. Muslim. They're Muslims, they're Christians. Um, I met a Christian nun, uh, originally from South India, but she was posted at um, a church in Prayagraj, and she was a big supporter of Mataji because even she was facing similar um, institutional inequities in 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 her in in um, her community, in her church, and she was seeking greater opportunities for women to use their potential. These female Shankaracharyas are not arguing that this is what all women need to be doing. No, they're not saying that at all. I mean, they, they still talk about dharma as you know, people are expected to fulfill certain duties. However, in those cases where women feel this extraordinary pull toward the sacred, where they feel this extraordinary Pull to serve the world, and they have the talents to do it. Why are they being stopped? And why mm. are these arguments that, um, you know, for being used to prevent them from achieving these leadership positions that, as Swamini and both Mataji suggest in their interviews, could really increase people's participation within the movements? So, both women, to answer your question, are they have growing, sizable communities that support them. With Swamini, um, it seems that her community, I'm, I've never worked with her. My ethnographic work is with Mataji. So what I have been able to um, argue about Swamini's leadership is based on my tr um, translation and analysis of her interviews online. Um, mm -hmm. So, Your but primary her, work is in Prayagras in India, not in Nepal, right? You, right, 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 exactly. Mm -hmm. My my work is in India and Prayagraj. Um, so, but her community seems also to to cross cut caste identities and caste status. So, um, I would say caste is a huge element because here, let's say it this way: when we talk about gender in religion, any religion, we're not just talking about gender. Um, in Indic mm -hmm. context, we're talking about, because gender doesn't exist by itself. Gender mm -hmm. exists uh, uh, along with a person's class status, caste identity, sexual identity, uh, linguistic identity. There are all these layers. Intersectional, right? Intersectional. Yes, absolutely. Intersectional, I mean, intersectional approaches is looking mm -hmm. at, okay, so, how does, um, how can we nuance our understanding of the role of religion or the role of women's leadership in religions when we can see how um, gender identity intersects with all these sort of, mm -hmm. um, right. you know, equally significant right. constituents of social identity. Yes. So, yeah. Great, I'm glad, really pleased to see my, my professor. Frederick Smith has also joined from University of Iowa, probably now he's in New Mexico, but any questions, sir, or anybody else, attendees, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask her directly, or you can chat, you can type in the chat window. And uh, I had no clue uh, of so many things that you shared, so I'm really educated better on, on this very important phenomenon happening 
right here in India and Nepal also. So who do you think is, is has larger following right now in India or in Nepal? So Nepal oh. is the Swamini, India is Prayagraj's Mataji, right? That's right. That is right. correct. So, I, so which one I, has larger following? I would say, um, just judging um, from the number of ashrams and um, just I would say Swamini at this point because okay, so Swamini has Swamini that is in Nepal, right? In yeah, Nepal. in Nepal, okay. Swamini okay. has um, an ashram with uh -huh. like over three hundred acres of land where oh, she wow. has she served like, and it's an ashram that she's heading, and it was her guru's ashram. So the guru passed uh -huh. the mantle onto her, and she's become mm -hmm. the uh, the Pita Dishwood of. Wow. Uh, of this um of this ashram is it near Kathmandu? where exactly from Kathmandu? You know? in gori ganj in, in okay. um gori ganj that's where near, her near okay. yes yes that's Not where her yeah. ashram is but here's the thing um mm -hmm. swamini is also a maha mandaleshwar in the juna okay. akara juna akara right. Right. so she also runs five different ashrams or temples in india oh so she Nepal. has uh, yeah, yeah. Living in Nepal, Nep she's running five ashrams in India. Okay. In India, that's right. Because as okay. a Mahama Andaleshwar, she has been a Sri Mahent. She was elected Sri Mahent. She became um, uh, a Mahama Andaleshwar with the Juna Akara. And so she's leading these different temples and ashrams. And so she's building her constituency from two different places. So we have one more question from Dr. Yadav. Uh, please ask directly. Yes. So okay. um Do you read mm -hmm. the question? Yeah. Okay. Oh, you have read it. Okay. <laughs> I have read the question. So that's an yeah. yeah, absolutely. My work talks about this. Um and the talk that I gave today is actually based on um an uh, a, an article that's going to be published um in the co-edited volume that I'm doing with my colleague, Jung McDaniels, that's part of this special issue with religions, gurus, priestesses, <laughs> saints, mediums, yoginis, holy women, as <laughs> influencers, and Hindu cultures, but just, it's also being published as a book. Oh. So, um, I yes, so purity and pollution, yeah, these are big ideas in the mm -hmm. um, guru's narratives, and for Mataji and Swamini, purity has to do with one's intentions. Purity has to do with the one's moral state, one's awareness of the interconnectedness and permeability of all material existence. And because their revelations have enhanced their awareness, their, their perception that, that like we're all commingled, we're all interconnected, that there is, women are not intrinsically impure or more polluted than men simply because of their menstrual cycles. As a matter of fact, what I have seen in Mataji's case specifically is that she will draw on the idea of the goddess, the, the menstruating goddess, particularly using the example of um, the, the goddess tradition um, of at Guwahati um, in, in Assam. Uh -huh. and, and, and saying that, you know, the goddess menstruates, the goddess bleeds, and this is how she, you know, you know, this is our sort of um, physiological, biological connection to um, to the goddess. And mm -hmm. women are the you know creators of life. Like life begins in their bodies, and so you know the, the menstrual blood is is that um, signifier of women's you know deep deep power and connection to sort of just this dynamic creativity, generativity of life itself. So they are actually flipping this whole notion of contagion that is implicit in ideas of ritual purity and pollution on its head to emphasize moral purity as opposed to bodily or ritual purity. So this is where we see the inversion of values, the inversion of Brahminical, um, I would say dominant Brahminical values with regard to caste, with regard to gender relations, with regard to um, ritual purity, inverting it to emphasize moral purity, um, the uh, awareness of the everybody's 
equality as human beings, the inherent dignity, the intrinsic worthiness of, of all human beings. And this is how they are you know, weaving their arguments um, around this notion of female sadhus being normative to the male sadhus, because inherently, if everybody's absorbing um, qualities of each other, then we're all connected and we're all inherently intrinsically at the material level equal. Great. I typed one more question also from my side. Uh, speaking of yoginis, right? Do they refer to yes. the various yes. Yes. For yogini temples spread across India? Also, yes. do they make references to great female names such as Gargi, Maitri, in the Vedas? Yes, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. absolutely. So, one of the arguments that they make, because um, some of their critics are from uh, the beginning of Mataji's, not, you know, Mataji's claiming herself a female Shankaracharya in 2008, it, it wasn't highly publicized in the way that her creation of a women's akata, Pari Akata was in 2014. I mean, she had regional, um, local news stations and um, it just covering this. And so it got so much um, attention, so much um, coverage. And so what that did was it really just sort of um, gave the mainstream leaders a reason to, to critique her, to shoot her down. And so um, the um, idea was that she she's, she's not a real guru. And so she has been um, fighting against that. And so she's she's using media and so on and so forth to to fight against that. And what was the last part of your your question, um, Pankaj? Matri and Gargi mentioned in Upanishads and Vedas. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She uh, yeah, absolutely mentions yeah. them. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I was gonna say something else, but it escaped my mind. Uh, e yeah, even uh, do they make references to you know figures such as Mirabai? And of course, the goddess tradition of Durga and Saraswati Lakshmi. So I'm sure they make reference to all of those. I, I, you know, I haven't heard Mirabai referenced um, okay. as much as I hear Gargi, Maitreyi. Okay. Um, oh yeah, so this is what I was going to say. So um, both of the gurus, they are they are claiming that India's history of mm -hmm. the, the female Shankaracharya, okay. And or the female priestess, the the female religious authority, the woman with incredible, extraordinary gifts and religious authority, is an ancient tradition. There's an ancient lineage. They use the words vidushi. They talk mm -hmm. about the Vedic lineage, um, mm -hmm. Vedic uh, traditions of these women that have been suppressed, mm -hmm. but they haven't been exterminated. So mm -hmm. they say, you know, their critics want to argue that these women. Are defying tradition. They are defining Hindu Sanatana Dharma. Okay. And that's mm -hmm. a, such an ambiguous and big concept. It's not clear what right. people mean by it when they're using the, the very concept. However, right. these gurus say, no, we are not defying tradition. We're actually, in their words, revamping. We are, um, you know, bringing our traditions back. Hmm. You are the patriarchy. The religious patriarchy is the one that has defied the, the principles mm -hmm. of the tradition. And so we are just, you know, bringing back the glory mm -hmm. of women that has been suppressed by this patriarchy. So that's that's so what they are, are saying. So we are bringing back the original Sanatana then? Are they saying that? Or yes, are we yes. reforming it? So so it's revival, not reforming. Bringing, okay. bringing it back, but reforming it with respect to how to understand these mm -hmm. sort of categories of caste, these categories of, mm -hmm. of gender. Because even though mm -hmm. the gurus are, are, are teaching that women and men are inherently, ontologically speaking, the same, they mm -hmm. don't say that women are and men are the same. Uh, mm -hmm. That just wouldn't make sense to them. So it's a question of how do they... Um, reconfigure notions mm -hmm. of gender difference, notions of caste difference in ways that align with the revelations that they say that they have. Oh. And so they see themselves as really aligned with um, the what they would call like the original revelation mm -hmm. that was given to, let's say, Adi Shankaracharya and, and so on and so forth. And I, and I said, I had asked Mataji, if Adi Shankaracharya, you know, if he was an enlightened being, why didn't he also um, 
put women on the throne, yeah. so to speak, right. which yeah. is a very similar um, question that has been asked of the Buddha, right? If he uh -huh. was enlightened, yeah. why didn't he allow? And there's all these yes. different stories around it. But yeah. um, she said that, well, let's put it this way. He didn't prohibit women. There's a constitution, the Mat Amnaya, within the Shankaracharya lineage. And it's kind of, it has like all the rules and procedures. And she said there, you'll notice that it doesn't prohibit women from accessing the seat of power. And she will say, well, you know, every person is a product Hello. of their time. So he was enlightened, but he was enlightened yeah, hold up one second. to a Let degree. Just, uh, turn something off that I'm listening to here. Yes, is this Mark? Yeah, yeah, it sounded like you. Yeah. Hello? Hello? Hey, what's happening? Sorry, sorry. I... Yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, so, um, so he did prohibit, prohibit, like you were saying, yeah. Right. So females could still access the power, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I was aware of the fringe movement, such as, uh, you know, different uh, female spiritual leaders in Hindu tradition recently, you know, in the last 50 years, there have been so many, but you you brought out some really, you know, almost mainstream, all, she almost became Shankaracharya. That was, that is really, mm -hmm. that's really amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have one of the biggest questions that I get is, you know, why the Shankaracharya leadership role? Why that mm -hmm. role? I mean, yeah. you have yeah. women, there are there are a number of female gurus right, who exactly. are not claiming, who are not claiming yeah. themselves Shankaracharyas and really have even no intention Shard or desire. Sharda, even Shardama, after, after Ramakrishna Paramahansa passed away, Shardama was pretty much leading the whole Ramakrishna movement, right? I think she was one yes, of the first, right, probably the first right. female guru after Ramakrishna Paramahansa. But that's that was right. far cry from you know claiming Shankaracharya. <laughs> that's, that's a that's a very different tradition. Right. And so exactly. um, you know, why is it that these women are claiming this status yeah. when yes. it's not necessary in order for women to exercise authority, to create mm -hmm. traditions that are um providing equal opportunities or greater opportunities for women's um, learning, education freedom, ritual roles. So why the Shankaracharya role? And I believe it has to do with reordering the monastic structures mm -hmm. because monasticism in, in Hindu culture is, you know, it's, it's it has a lot of symbolic as well as cultural significance. And the Shankaracharyas as these leaders of the army, as you know, the chiefs, mm -hmm. you know, this, yes. this, the, you know, the history is rich, but also the symbolism goes back to like this erstwhile, um, you know, the rulership. These, these Shankaracharyas are like the religious rulers. And who sits on the throne? You know, that in and of itself becomes a, a symbolic way of communicating, you know, who has the right to lead? Yeah. Who has the right to be um, at yeah. the head? Um, of yeah. the army, at the head of the people, at the head of the yeah. nation. And so both of the gurus are saying, look, you have women who give birth, who gave birth to these Shankaracharya. So <laughs> why can't they be a Shankaracharya? You mm -hmm. think that physiological female difference with respect mm -hmm. to menstruation, with respect to capacities for childbirth and, and mm -hmm. um, procreation to, to argue Women need to be Shankaracharyas. Mm -hmm. What about the the... Kumbh Mela? Do they come at Kumbh Mela and participate during the Kumbh Mela? I'm the sorry? Kumbh Mela. Kumbh Mela? Kumbh... Prayer, yes. They come yes. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So BBC, um, BBC has an, um, a very short interview of um, Swamini. And mm -hmm. I'm actually in that interview because I was interviewing... Oh. <laughs> um, I, it's, but you, I'm not speaking. I mean, I'm just at a okay. camp. I'm at um, another female guru's camp whom I didn't talk about today. It's Ananmai, Ananmai oh, Puri. Yeah. And she she had established a women power camp. So I spent time with her at the 2019 Kumbh Mela. And little did we know that BBC India's team <laughs> was there. And so they were you know, gathering images around the question of um, why is there such um, mm. a dearth of female yeah. gurus of, of female monastics and, and women in these yeah. positions, ritual positions of power and authority. Um, and so Swamini does speak for um, very briefly oh, in that okay. interview. Okay. And I actually talk about that interview in the article that's gonna be 
published in this special issue and, and as a book um, that's that's coming out later later this summer. So, great. Uh, let's see if anybody else has any questions. Anybody else? Probably not. So we will. Uh, yeah, we'll share this recording on all social media platforms: YouTube and podcast, Spotify, Google, Apple, everywhere. And, and could you Amazon, also share it with me? Audible, could you also share it with me? Of course. Of course, of course, please. So this way, I can yes. I can make it available yes. to my yes. students yes. when I teach about female ritual authority, yes. and, they, the and they can and, and they can watch this, and then we can just have yes. the discussion in class. <laughs> thank you so much. I think really insightful, and uh, thank you, and have a great day. Thank okay. you, okay. thank you. Namaste. Okay. Bye.